Thank you for taking the time to check out the Inside Myanmar podcast. If you like what you hear, we would be very grateful if you might consider rating, reviewing, and or sharing this podcast. Every little bit of feedback helps. Also, be sure to subscribe to the Inside Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And if your feed is not in your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure it can be offered there. Welcome back. Today I'm joined by Alan Clemens following the release of his book. And we're going to be talking about the book, but more broadly, we're going to be talking about the philosophical ramifications of the book and the different dimensions of the ongoing conflict and the Myanmar context and how we can understand those through the lenses of femininity, philosophy, theology, history, and ultimately human nature. But before we get into that, uh, Alan, I'd, I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself for the audience and, and let them know uh, what experiences you've had uh, in Myanmar. Uh, yeah, it's a great honor to be here with you and uh, listeners, uh, both within Myanmar and around the world. My name is Alan Clements. Uh, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, as the real issue for me is the ongoing radical crises in Myanmar, Burma, and how we can participate, how we can support the people of that country undergoing what I call a genocide of democracy and freedom and human rights, and so many other terms attributed to the criminal terrorist, Burma's former general, Ming Online, who is now the foremost criminal terrorist in the world after the drone murder of the Al-Qaeda leader appointed by bin Laden back in Kabul by President Biden. Biden. Uh, my history in Burma goes back to 1976, 77. I went there to ordain as a Buddhist monk. I had read a book attributed to Mahasi Sayadaw's teachings on mindfulness meditation and Vipassana insight meditation and uh, went there specifically to meet that man as one of the foremost, if not the foremost teacher leader of this ancient tradition attributed to the Buddha, which of course has become global today. Mindfulness is ubiquitous, even in areas of military and corporations. 1979, jump time. Uh, I was unaware that Burma was influenced under the depravity, if you will, of, of, of um, the dictator at the time. And uh, so in 1979, I invited Mahasi Sayadaw to come to America, to Los Angeles and to the Boston area to do two 10-day, 14-day mindfulness meditation retreats, to cut it to the point the end of those two retreats, which were remarkably prolific and groundbreaking, I asked Mahasi Sayadaw and the entourage of monks if, in fact, I could return to his country and ordain to practice under his tutelage. His short answer was, it's more likely to be granted possibly a short-term visa if, in fact, you ordain as a Samanera a novice monk in New York and go back with us, they probably will interpret that as sincerity. 
I ordained in New York, flew back with him. And on the sixth day of my seventh day stay permit, um, I was granted a three month extension. I, and I was told it was one of the first extensions to a non-diplomat in some years. I immediately went into silence and intensive meditation at the Mahasi Satanayekta Meditation Center in Rangoon, Burma to indulge myself in what felt to be the most important undertaking of my life, which is to sit still, to walk, eat in silence, and to face myself and simply to feel the nature of consciousness and what was I doing, either knowingly or unknowingly, to contribute to my own suffering. And Mahasi Sero and the teachings of the Buddha, as I heard them, offered a very direct approach to self-liberation. And so freedom was the operative word that led me to Myanmar. It was what brought me into the monastic order. It what kept me in context to the nuns and monks. And eventually in 1984, having been removed from the country several times by the dictator, told to leave within 24 hours, on the fourth time I was told to leave, I actually disrobed as a monk and went back to America to begin to lead retreats upon invitation as a lay person. Jump time to 1988, 8888, the ubiquitous time, August 8th, 1988, as most people in the world know, but simply as a refresher, when the students and the youth of that time essentially said, we have had enough of, of, of oppression, of, of toxic patriarchy, to use my word, uh, the abuse of totalitarianism, the violence, the torture, the oppression, the obedience, do it as I say, or suffer the consequences of confiscation of land, property, business, money, rape, torture, all the things that we see today, jump time 2023, repeating ad nauseum again and again and again. Do we see these, these, these convulsions of violence and terrorism engulfing this ancient, exquisite land of 132 cultures and languages and dialects, 50 million approximately people, with Islam and Judaism and atheism and Buddhism and so many different philosophies and teachings available in this country, the size of what, Germany, France. And in 88, I became riveted, if you will, by this uprising primarily because friends of mine who I'd known as a monk both monks and nuns and lay men were involved in this uprising, a nationwide, what they called a revolution of the spirit. First and foremost, let us examine our own unrecognized anger, our own unrecognized greed, our own fear, and do all that we can to elevate the status of our own consciousness as we transform society through nonviolent means, politically, socially, and hopefully even spiritually, thus the name, A Revolution of the Spirit, Burma's second great struggle for freedom after the assassinated general, Da Aung San Suu Kyi's father, and the elected leaders at that time succeeded in freedom from the UK back in 1945. And so I listened to Da Aung San Suu Kyi's speech through translation at the Shwedagon Pagoda to nearly a half a million people. And I, like many people, were deeply touched and inspired. Halfway through my introduction, unable to sit and uncomfortably, comfortably continue my life you know, as a 35-year-old white male leading retreats in America and around the world, 
and thinking that my friend and my family possibly were being harmed or tortured or killed, I got a phone call from a former monk of mine with gunshots in the background and asked, Alan, can you help me leave the country? And from that, my nonprofit helped him leave the country. But as a result of that, I personally felt compelled to go back into the country, which I did underground, to see for myself what this uprising was, how it was played out, had my friends and my family and fellow nuns and monks been harmed. Burma was my spiritual home. These were my family. The finest days of my life happened in Burma. And so I went in underground, and as a result of that two-week movement through Yangon, back at the day it was called Rangoon, I met with a lot of different people, and I was infinitely horrified to be in the context of terrorism and murder and violation I'd never known it in my life. I was an American that grew up with music and psychedelics and poetry and lovemaking and dance. And here it was within my own spiritual family, this egregious, traumatizing, unrelenting tyranny. And it freaked me out to the point where I felt emboldened from an outside point of view. I am not courageous. This is not my war. This is not my revolution. I am merely an outsider. And I took notes and I interviewed friends and I looked firsthand. And eventually when the underground secret police heard about me and came looking, I fled the country and went underground to the Burma-Thailand border to a place called Mesot, and at that time, a place called Menaplaw, which turned out to be the recognized capital, home ground, if you will, of the most revolutionary of the students that were at the epicenter of the 888 uprising that were not imprisoned or disappeared or murdered. And I spent several months there, going in and out of Menaplaw, out into the jungles, meeting members of the KNU, going to Shan State, and meeting all the members that were thought of as the leaders at the time of the ABSDF. And I, again, was both radically inspired and deeply heartbroken that these people, some of them I knew as monks and nuns, now from the peace and the sanctity of a monastery, me with an American passport that could go back to Bangkok at any moment, my brothers and sisters were there out of choice to fight this revolution. And it brought up the deepest philosophical challenges I'd ever known in my life. Do you stay and fight? Or do you take notes and flee? Do you raise money around the world to feed and house and to heal? And so after three months, I stayed and learned. I met with the underground parallel government that the anointed prime minister, Dr. Sane Win, Do Aung San Suu Kyi's cousin was the head of, I met all the people associated with that, that parallel government along with the ABSCF. And I said, the best thing for me to do would be to take as best as I could in my own humble way, the photographs, the notes, and the heart script that came from those four months and do my very best to share that information around the world in any way that I could find accessible through the media, through lecture and talk. And lo and behold, in the last one-tenth of this introduction, I'm sorry to go on so long, but when I got to Bangkok, little did I know that somehow it was known that I, as an American, a former Buddhist monk in Burma, 
who had met underground with the ABSDF and the Dr. St. Wynn and his parallel government and was there firsthand, going to many of these areas and villages that had been burned with people beheaded, engaged in firefights with the ADSDF and some of the military associated with the Tamada, that many of the international media were there to interview me and to hear from me my firsthand experience of what went on. And that led to, here it is, 2023, and that was in 1989, 1990, um, three decades and a half of, of ongoing frustration, ongoing heartbreak, ongoing inspiration to be an outsider holding space and support for my beloved brothers and sisters and uncles and teachers and mentors and guides throughout the country of Burma, not just the Burmese. I've traveled the country numerous times. Back in the day, I could speak the language quite well to bring their revolution as I understood it from my humble investigations to the broader public through TV, radio. At that time, there were not podcasts, but through books and films. And as a result, most noted, I went back into the country in 1995 underground again to meet with Da Aung San Suu Kyi, who had just been released from six years of detention. I was introduced to her by her colleague, U Tin U, the former general of the army. <clears throat> And uh, we spent six months in underground conversation that led to a book titled by her called The Voice of Hope, Conversations uh, with Aung San Suu Kyi. And uh, as a result of that, I was uh, thrown out of the country. I was banned and vilified for 17 years. And many of the people associated with the book Many of the people that I were in contact with, not directly because of me or the book, but within a few months after the release of that book, found themselves back incarcerated, either imprisoned or in hard labor or in solitary confinement, including Uchi Meng, Uwen Tain, Da Aung San Suu Kyi, so many of them went back in and for the most part for the next what five six seven ten twelve fifteen years on and off we led through those dark years of abject imprisonment silence and torture a revolution that was fought in many many unusual ways but we did our best in the west to bring their courage to bring their story to life through film book article television. And as a result, I'll close here. Uh, I've had a number of different co-authors, Leslie Kane, uh, Fergus Harlow. We've done maybe, what, 12 books on Burma, two films. And most recently, as of the last couple of days, our latest book titled Aung San Suu Kyi from Prison with a subtitle, A Letter to a dictator. This came on after our four books that were released October of last year, 2000 pages, co-authored with Fergus Harlow called Burma's Voices of Freedom. These were 10 years of on the ground interviews that I did after meeting Aung San Suu Kyi in San Francisco when she was awarded the Vaclav Havel Award for, for Creative Dissent. I told her that the president um, had, had unbanned me and I asked her for her advice. She said, if you would please, please return to my country and carry on with bringing my people's voices to the world. And so for the next 10 years, I went into the country maybe 20, 30 times that resulted in probably close to a million 
words of transcription of long form interviews of not of just the famous people in the revolution, but my goal was to bring the voices of the people, cafe workers, taxi drivers, slave laborers, journalists, teachers, doctors, nurses, including all the greats from the, the, the extraordinary courage of Uwin Tin, the journalist who spent nearly 21 years in solitary. I spent five days and five long form interviews with the gentleman bringing his 21 years of torturous incarceration and courage as one of the 50 interviews in those four volumes of books, including Uchi Mong and so on and so forth. And so here with the release of this book, it's not my final statement to Burma, but I could not in good faith continue to stand by and watch military coup d'etat by Ming Online turned criminal terrorist and an indoctrinated group of men and women who are no longer military personnel, but terrorists at large, persecuting, raping, burning, torturing the people of beloved Burma. And so this book was by way of inviting the world media, listen, there is something to be said that's not being said about Burma. It's in this book. Please, I invite you worldwide. BBC, CNN, Washington Post, New York Times. You got it wrong about Burma. You got it wrong about Do Aung San Suu Kyi, the vilification program about her. You got it wrong, corporate media. In this book, the first part, which we won't get into right now, just as a simple introduction, is a set of interviews in her words, refuting the global dialogue of vilification about her of what she didn't do and what she should have done. That's part one of the book. But the book goes far beyond trying to vindicate Da Aung San Suu Kyi. It is our belief in this book to bring what we want the world to hear and to do, to bring a solution to this incredible tyranny in Burma for the world to possibly learn a political spiritual lesson that is in our hands if we so choose to take it. So that's that's the beginning of of of, of my introduction and getting into the book. So thank you for that. And, and I do like the way you've touched on a couple of, I mean, quite a few different things, but one of them is the importance of the world learning a lesson. Myanmar is in, I mean, the, the, it's almost cliche at this point to say that Myanmar is at a crossroads and we are well and truly in the crossroad at this point, but it could go either way. And and I think it is imperative that the international community pay attention to Myanmar. It is imperative that the international community get invested in Myanmar and be aware that no matter what happens, this is going to be taught for decades as a case study, either in how you can guarantee that a state would fail or in how you can establish a, a thriving and healthy democracy um, in a region that is that is still beset by by militarism and dictatorships. So I think... I, I think there is a lot of significance and importance to to the subject matter, and 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 we thank you for writing the book. So let's get into it. So this is a book in three parts, and and it's probably best if we handle each one separately. And the first part of the book you've already alluded to is Aung San Suu Kyi in her own words, uh, but. Of course, th this book was quite recently written, and, and Aung San Suu Kyi, as we know, continues to be held in in appalling conditions in Naypyidaw by the military. So, how how was this section of the book actually accomplished? Okay, great question. the The title of the book is to draw attention to her. 
Obviously, we had no underground contact with her while she's been detained. However, I've had a lot of contact with people who have been detained, who have had contact. I'm not going to name anything beyond that. That first part of the book is not about her today. The other parts of the book are about Burma today, including her. But the first part of the book, and please, this is a very unusual point. My colleague, Fergus Harlow, few people know of him, one of the most educated, erudite, dedicated investigative journalist activists that I've ever met or known worldwide. He and I have been working together nearly 15 years on Burma for the last 12. We've co-authored Burma's Voices of Freedom together, um, the book Wisdom for the World by Da Aung San Suu Kyi, spiritual advisor, uh, Seda Upandita, which is a very important book that very few people know about. Very few people know that Nelson Mandela had a spiritual guide. Very few people knew that Gandhi had a spiritual teacher. Very few people knew that Martin Luther King or Thich Nhat Hanh had spiritual guides or teachers. Few people know who Da Aung San Suu Kyi's spiritual guide and teacher was. His name was the late Venerable Seda Upandita. He was Utin U's guide. He was the guide of many of the NLD leaders. He was my teacher for nearly 35 years. There's a lot to be said about him. It's found in the book, Wisdom for the World and Mindful Advice for My People. But back to the first section of the book. What Fergus did, this is to show his dedication, tracked down everything available online that Da Aung San Suu Kyi has said in the last, could it be 10 years or 12 years since her last release? Was it in 2010 or was it in 2012? I'm not sure. Everything she said worldwide, press releases, lectures, radio, TV, two minute snippets, the BBC talks, in-country talks, in-country lectures, transcriptions, translations, 500, 600, 700, 800,000 words were put together of her words and only her words and that of the interviewers other than me. And it was clearly marked when, where, and by what media source did we locate it? We took the last five years of the most salient comments that she has made publicly, footnoted it where she said it, on what media source, and who was the interviewer, where she directly addresses the issues that she has been vilified for, for not speaking up about, or not addressing, and on and on and on. We wrote a list of the criticisms and we let her in her own words address those criticisms, even to the point of her saying, I've been repeatedly criticized for not speaking up for the Rohingya. Allow me to say again that I have spoken up. They refuse to report it. They refuse to say that I have spoken up and let me say it again such and such a date, such and such an interviewer, and this particular media source. That's the first one-fifth of the book. In her words, with one-sentence questions that we came up with to address the most vile, denigrating, and controversial issues attributed to Da Aung San Suu Kyi from the beginning, from the beginning of the Rohingya crisis, was it four, five, six, seven years ago? So she refutes the criticisms in her own words. Don't believe us, but stop saying she didn't say it. And when you do say that, start referring to this is where she said it, and then say something about what you want to say, but stop saying that she didn't say it, or she could have said it this way. Okay? Da Aung San Suu Kyi is not perfect. This is not about exonerating her personality. 
I spent a lot of months with her. She's a difficult person. She is extraordinarily valued, ethically sound, profoundly satirical and funny, intensely, intensely present, radically curious, but she is not complicit with genocide or with tyranny or with absconding from the compassionate role of supporting the Rohingya or the Buddhists anywhere in the Rakhine state, as well as a lot of the ethnic minorities around the country. Is she to be faulted at times? Absolutely. And we include statements of how she should be faulted in her own words. So I could go on and on and on about the first fifth of the book, but I don't want to give away all the most important points. But hey, listen, if you're going to criticize Da Aung San Suu Kyi, read the book, okay, dude? CNN, BBC, Washington Post, whoever you are out there, just drop your narrative until you read the book and or have someone invite me onto your TV show, your podcast, your whatever it is, your platform, and tell me that I am full of SHIT. Okay, and I'm willing to stand there and listen to you and I'll retort and respond accordingly. So so that's sort of, Look at this issue. I don't want you to sort of necessarily give away um, all of the the sort of points of the book. Obviously, we want people to read it, but I wonder if how you would describe the trajectory of Aung San Suu Kyi in mainstream media. Because back in eighty eight, you know, she really came up. She really made a name for herself. Then she was in house arrest for a lengthy period of time. The obvious comparisons were drawn to Nelson Mandela. Um, and and to a lesser extent, comparisons being drawn to Dr. Martin Luther King, and she wins the the Nobel Peace Prize. Her children have to accept it. That are, she becomes this very large image, even in the West, of humility and grace and and self sacrifice in the quest for freedom and democracy and and progress and fighting against militarism with compassion. Dude, and then she's getting death threats. Her kids are getting death threats. Kogi King at the airport's being assassinated with his kid in his arms. This woman is under unrelenting tyranny by psychopaths, serial killers on a countrywide level. She spent 19 years in confinement, the woman is traumatized. All of her people are radically traumatized, but she is not a violent, complicit woman with a genocidal psychopath called the military or the Thamada. They're kept in the dark. They're given misinformation. I spent 10 years on the ground talking to the people closest to her and to her. They got it wrong. They didn't do their investigative journalism in depth. I've had numerous death threats. Even to meet me was threatening for them. To get this information is threatening. I've had death threats even up until the last seven months. She has been under siege. Look where she is today. This is not a woman who's been complicit with murder, rape, and denigration. She's filled with compassion at the same time. Who in the world could handle the complexity of hell under a psychopathic army led by a terrorist criminal in one of the most complicated circumstances in the world being supplied and supported by the psychopath in China, Xi Jinping, the idiot psychopath Putin in Russia, Burma was the next Tibet and people blew it. The Bay of Bengal is oil rich like Saudi Arabia. They blew it. Burma is a slave ghost state of people who are willing to work and die for a penny. You blew it, West. You gave Burma to a dictatorship and you vilified Aung San Suu Kyi. The consequences are the death of the nation if we do not intervene. You got it wrong. Read the book. I'm a little old person from the outside. How did I get it right? You think I'm so passionately crazy? I want to lie to the world? But I'm willing to debate anyone in CNN, New York Times, President Biden, the United Nations Security Council, Trudeau, anyone. 
Let's stand on the information. I can make a case for why she went to the world court. I can make a case for why she has done what she's done. Is she 100% right? Listen, when someone goes off on me and just looks at me the wrong way, I normally just give them the F-U-C-K, off. Could you imagine having my daughter raped and murdered by someone and still wanting to talk to them? Burma is governed by one of the most maniacal, evil, terrorist organizations our planet has seen. End of story. And there is a solution. And part of that solution is for the world to rally around the most obvious 23 ethnic minorities that are armed, the other 110 that are unarmed, and the 50 million people of the country from all religions and philosophies, and the civilian government that did an epic turnaround from an evil military that won democracy and demand what I'm about to share in the upcoming minutes of this very important conversation that you and I are having that I don't hear is being done anywhere. The, the issue of vindicating Aung San Suu Kyi is almost, it's not so what, we did it as one part of the book. The bigger issue still remains to be spoken. But I do demand that she's part of the solution and part of that solution is the immediate release of 12,000 political prisoners, the immediate release of the president and Do Aung San Suu Kyi. And those are just to start. And we can get into the variations on what I think are the solutions that are so near at hand, they're almost like laughable, they're so doable. If only leaders around the world had the moral courage to stand up. And I hope that they hear you and me and wherever this interview goes and wherever it's translated and go, you know what? The guy's passionate. He's pretty intense. He's got a vested interest in it. He's put some skin in the game, but he's got a point. He's offering a solution that will help resolve the problems of democracy in the world and the credibility of leaderships around the world at a time where democracy and citizens around the world have lost trust in their elected leaders. But so you, you, I'd be very interested to hear um, your case for the, the ICJ because you specifically brought up the ICJ and Aung San Suu Kyi choosing to go to the ICJ to represent Myanmar in the case that was brought by the Gambia attracted a lot of international criticism. It was widely seen as using her PR position to defend a country against allegations of a genocide that the military were actively denying while they were actively carrying it out. I hear you, and I don't want to... I We have the, we have the transcript in the book. I've watched mm -hmm. it dozens of times. She doesn't defend military aggression. Okay. She doesn't defend okay. genocide. She's speaking to a solution to an extremely complicated dilemma of, on the one hand, an evil oppressor, and she knows as well as anyone what it means to be on the receiving end of their evil, and an extremely complicated circumstance in Rakhine State that very few people know about the complications there. And she's in the middle as an elected leader trying, trying to resolve what seems to be an impossible circumstance with a fem, I use this word, a feminine inspired solution called reconciliation. If we agree on one side and vilify the other, it'll only propagate the vilification and the war. We've got to come in between, like the Buddha said, and call off the aggression. We've got to stop and listen and talk. After all, she is one of the elected leaders of the civilian government. People do not realize the military was not part of the government. They were wanting to kill Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Proof of point, they kill Kogni Ni, an elected National League for Democracy member from Rakhine State who was a Muslim and one of her best friends. 
She hired and brought in Kofi Annan, one of the most noble of secretary generals of the United Nations, for a year-long study in Rakhine State, as you know as well as I do, to look carefully on the ground. How can the Buddhists, how can the Muslims, how can the atheists, how can the Jews live together with equal rights and education and food and supply? Days before that release, there was a systematic, call it what you will, attack on military installations and police installations. Almost completely overlooked is the word, a year-long study by Kofi Annan, initiated by Da Aung San Suu Kyi, for a solution of peace and harmony and well-being that included the Rohingya. I could go on and on and on. I don't want to give the book away, but she is not what they say she is. Again, it's hard to realize what it means to have a sociopath in your living room who's already shown you firsthand, I'll blow your friend's head off with his kid in his arms if you step out of line. I was told how many times when I was in Napido underground by people close to her. Alan, they threaten us all the time with murder. Okay, what do you do with that? Am I, I'm not defending her by going to The Hague, but she did not defend genocide. She did not defend the Thamadol. She tried to bring peace and to keep these warring factions aside and to do the impossible. Could she have said something a little bit more that said, listen, what the Rohingya are undergoing is horrendous. I'd have to go back and study the transcript to see what she actually said or didn't say. But I could go on and on about that. But I disagree with the premise of what we're talking about right now, that she did not stand up and that she did not support the military. It was a parallel, it's a parallel government, and they're not to even be equated with the word government. They're a terrorist organization. Proof of the point. February 21 until this moment, look what they've done to their own people. I'm wondering how you would describe then Aung San Suu Kyi's sort of fall from grace within media. Like what would you consider to be the motivation for media, especially in the West, to turn on someone that previously was a was a vaunted sort of symbol of, of progress and democracy? I hear you. Bear, bear with me. And I know this is going to be probably to my detriment, but you know, look at the corporate media's position on vaccination, non-vaccination. I don't know where you stand on that, but look at the tsunami of disinformation that we could attribute that's coming out now to CNN, BBC, New York Times, Washington Post. Some of the most trusted medical institutions in the world lied to us. Why would the, why would the corporate media lie to us? I mean, the position that I see in Burma that that somehow the maniacal sociopath Xi Jinping, and I don't mean to offend him any more than he offends people simply by mass rape, incarceration, and and do what I say or follow or or, or suffer a terrible consequence. But I think like we wanted Iraq, I think he wants Burma, like he wants Tibet. Burma is the next Tibet, and he has Burma now. Burma is what? I think China has 33 different large counties or whatever the word is, sections of the country. I think 15 of the 33 sections of China are larger than the entire country of Burma. And when you look at the amount of oil that's coming out of the Bay of Bengal in that 1,200 mile long or 1,200 meter long pipeline that goes from off the Bay of Bengal through central Burma into Yunnan province. Hello, why are we supporting Saudi Arabia as a totalitarian government that is massacring the people of Yemen? Oil, money, weapons. And I think Burma serves the world to have China not be too upset. Hey, listen, dude, you do what you do. You You've attacked Iraq, you've attacked Afghanistan and spent $7 trillion of your taxpayers' money. Give us Burma, 50 million people. We want a little bit of oil to run our country. We like Tibet. We need some high altitude, clean water. We need slave labor to buy plastics and antibiotics. Burma is suffering. They're just cattle. 
They're just like stock animals. They'll work for anything because they're so oppressed. What's the problem over there in Washington? You mm -hmm. do it. Why can't we do it? I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, but I wouldn't be surprised that you could look to Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping and to the whoever the people are in Naypyidaw that control the puppet Ming online from Tan Shui around him. Who are these people in ASEAN? Who are the bankers in Singapore? Who is the second and third tier people that own the money and the loot and the real estate and all those condominiums and malls going down that used to be built in Rangoon? I think they gave it to China so that they could have oil slave labor and everything in America pretty much requires 80 people from other countries that we don't even know names of to be built and made for us to buy it at the price that we do. We're a country that lives on toxic patriarchy based upon enslavement, torture, oppression, and entitlement. I think that's what's gone down in Burma. And Do Aung San Suu Kyi, as a very attractive, well-educated woman, was an easy hit lady. Take her out. Give it to China. Can't lose. Look what we've done and look what the military done. Look what they did on, probably they were part of it, but they could not applaud long enough or victorious enough at how deeply she has fallen into so-called disgrace. To the point, look what they're doing now. They're eradicating democracy from ever taking root in Burma again, unless we act tonight. And these boys and girls in Gen X that are beyond epic in their morality, they're showing the world what freedom really looks like. And I'm only on the outside and I'm awed. I can't even imagine on the inside of what it means to be there. Hearing stories of young children, mom, dad, I can't go on another day, please kill me. The suffering of the people of Burma for what? Oil, money, clothing, plastics, antibiotics? tea, lumber, resources. I think that's the reason why Dong Sun Tzu Chi was not only thrown under the bus, I think it was just toxic misogyny. Take the bitch out. Let's show the world what it means to stand up to tyranny. Try it and see what happened to her. You can only imagine what's going to happen to you. Mm. So that's my kind of off-the-cuff well documented in my book. I wrote a letter to Ming Online, part of the book's subtitle, A Letter to a Dictator, which is not about murder. I'm not calling for his assassination. I'm not doing a Netanyahu, a targeted killing. I'm appealing to his conscience. It's my attempt at reconciliation through instigating a revolution of conscience at this last moment in time to help support my Dharma family, the people of my country, the people of Burma, all ethnicities, the birthplace of my revolutionary energy, not just my Dharma, but I care about democracy. I care about human rights. I care about freedom. I care about revolution. And Burma isn't just Burma for me. Burma is the hope of the planet. And so you've You've brought this up a couple of times, and I want to I want to touch on this because I think it's a, a fascinating insight that I I haven't quite heard this way before. But a few times you've already spoken about Aung San Suu Kyi um, and and the movement around her in terms of femininity, and you've spoken about the military and their hangers on in terms of patriarchy and in terms of uh, misogyny, and you seem to be framing the current conflict. Um, and not just the post-coup conflict, but the, the lengthy ongoing conflict between pro-democracy forces in the country and militarist forces in the country as a seemingly feminine masculine conflict. I'm wondering if you could expand on that and, and why you, you frame it in, in those terms. Obviously, as a man, I'm speaking about the word feminine inspired as a quality of consciousness not embodied intrinsically in gender. 
And when I associate the word feminine, I think of openness, transparency, the power of conversation over calculated violence, justice and acceptance over tyranny and oppression, equality over coercion, all the qualities of what I would attribute to be the archetypal intrinsic mother, perhaps, I hope, embedded in the genome of all of us, the mother that holds to the child of her breasts, the nurturance of sustainability. Aung San Suu Kyi speaks of Burma as a sustainable democracy that may not even be known in her own lifetime if we do it well and do it right. Feminine inspired behavior, point one. Point two, I can't say that I know her really well, but I spent six intimate months with her in her home talking to her about intimate subjects. I knew her husband, I knew her children. I knew many of her most intimate colleagues. She reiterated over and over again from the time I met her in 95 until the final time I met her, I don't know when it was, in 2021 or 20, a very obscure word that almost none of us can really understand called reconciliation. And if you remember that Burma's revolution of the spirit was intrinsically nonviolent, but intimately co-associated with we're going to have to learn to coexist together. And we want to do that coexistence without reverting to the fist, to the gun, to the jet, to the rifle, to torture, to violence, to toxic patriarchy and oppression. Her use and her repeated emphasis on reconciliation, I attribute to feminine inspired revolution. She said to me over and over again, why can't we just learn to talk about our differences? What is the fine art of dealing with complex topics? Another point I think it's worth mentioning, but we bring this point up in the book in one of the sections. So I really don't want to give that point away. We really look into the architecture, if you will, of nonviolent conversation. And this happened long before nonviolent conversation became popular in America. Da Aung San Suu Kyi's principal advisor, not her meditation teacher alone, the late Venerable Seda Upandita, who is the successor to my preceptor as a monk, Mahasi Sayadaw, he quietly introduced the NLD leadership and those associated with those leaders to the architecture, bear with me here, the sonic auditory architecture of nonviolent communication. It's not just the use of words, it's tonality, it's spatial, it's about timing, it's about body language. It's about choice of words. It's about your relationship to motivation and to outcome. And about 10 to 20 other variations or nuances that he talked about that were connected to the auditory revolutionary power of language as means of revolution to challenge male, toxic, totalitarian, or dictatorial violent patriarchy. Very, very, very few people know what I just said came from a source, the late Venerable Seda Upandita. He was a master of communication, and he taught the people of the NLD, including Da Aung San Suu Kyi, the art of nonviolent speech. If you listen to her lectures, I was there for every one of them when she was released. We have them on tape. I've interviewed her numerous times. I've interviewed numerous of her colleagues. If you could study the language of their communication, and if I pointed out with a PowerPoint how it comes back to something that they've learned 
either through Seda Upandita or someone connected to him, you would see that there is a discernible program that those words fit into. That is called the power of nonviolent revolution through the use of conscientious language, tonality, timing, space, etymology, syntax, meaning, and non-attachment to outcome, and the purity of motivation. How few of us, and I'll close here, how few of us can really say, I know what I'm saying in my heart because I know the texture of it is truthful. How many people are driven by, I know what I'm saying to be true, only to be revealed as self-deceptive? This is what I'm going to get into if we want to get into the power of reconciliation in action was one of Da Aung San Suu Kyi's favorite phrases. Not just about reconciliation, shaking hands and let's get on with our differences. Let's learn from each other how not to do this again. Let's learn how not to have our family, our daughter, our uncle's daughter gang raped by indoctrinated soldiers. No one wants that to happen to their daughter. Let's learn how to decode our culture from that. After all, we espouse to be Buddhists predominantly. We have all the other religions and all the other ethnicities. We have an incredible opportunity to show the world the power of diverse ethnicities and languages and religions and philosophies, all under one government called democracy. How we learned to coexist through the power of feminine inspired communication as the basis of universal human rights and democracy, justice, unity, and freedom. And that's where I come from when I speak about Da Aung San Suu Kyi as feminine inspired, but I could go on about it, but this isn't the place to do that. A, a fascinating way to look at this. And a little bit later when we, we talk about the, the last component of the book, uh, I want to sort of look at the theological aspects of, of the military's mentality. And again, I think this theme of femininity, or more importantly, the theme of misogyny is going to come up again, because that is very deeply interwoven into the fabric of, of uh, military identity. But before we stampede into that, uh, let's transition to the second part of the book. Um, so I understand the second part of the book was not written by you personally, was it? What are the components of the book in brief? So we've talked about the first section to be that of a pretty masterful presentation of an interview with Da Aung San Suu Kyi over about seven years from material gathered in the public domain and footnoted specifically to the date, the interviewers, and the media source with questions that we posed that she answered based on those interviews that were transcribed or collected. The second, third, and fourth, and fifth part of the book, it could be said there's only three parts, but to break it into the more nuanced five parts, the second part is an interview that I did with my colleague and co-author, Fergus Harlow, who I consider to be just just a radically nuanced student of fascism, totalitarianism, indoctrination, uh, mind control, misinformation, democracy, revolution, specifically to Burma, as well as during World War II. He's, he's a very rare savant in those areas that for some reason today, they become global memes, if you will to try to study. So I interviewed Fergus for the second part of the book, and it's a fascinating discussion about his research, his insights, his understanding uh, as they relate to the politics of Burma, to the psychology of totalitarianism, and specifically to why the world possibly did what they did in the corporate media to Da Aung San Suu Kyi, and some very difficult questions about the Rakhine crisis. I, I did not play into being his colleague. I played into being very adversarial at times to get the best of him. That's the second part of the book, an interview with Fergus Harlow. 
and I can't wait for him to be on this program. The third part is the letter that I brought up to Ming online, the former general of Burma's Thumbada, which I have now labeled the world's leading criminal terrorist organization by the acronym MA, Ming Online, M-A-H, SAC, State Administration Council, MA SAC, like Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge or Bin Laden's, you know, whatever his idiot group was, but Ming Online's MA SAC. I wrote a letter to him because I was encouraged when I got involved in Burma's politics. Alan, when you talk in the media, when you write, I would encourage you. This is this is the words of Dong San Suu Kyi, by the way, and Seda Upandita, and Utinu, and Uchi Mong, and Uwintain, and many others. I want you to see that person in the room with you and you say things that you would say only if you would say it to them in person. And so I said, I, I can't, I can't be in Napido. Although in the letter I ask him, sir, please invite me to Napido. I will risk being there to do a book of conversations with you called Conversations with Ming Online, the former dictator of Myanmar. Okay, that's the basis of the letter. The essence or the soul of the letter in one minute is based upon what many I would call classical or classical Theravadan Buddhists, both in Burma and around the world, would know is the discourse or the sutta about Angulimala, primarily known as the foremost serial killer at the time of the Buddha coupled with the most famous emperor or political leader ever in the history of Buddhism from the inception 2,622 years ago to today, King Ashoka in ancient India. These two men, the one sutta, the Angulimala and King Ashoka are the basis of the letter to Ming Online, and they both have to deal with one concept. The the, the beauty, if you will, I say that very relatively, the beauty of redemption, meaning that I, through my radical self-honesty, see inside of myself, the Burmese Buddhists know these words, hiri and otapa, conscious shame, conscious reflection. Oh, what I've done, what I've said, what I've thought has harmed someone. I cringe in conscience that I've done that. I want to seek restitution. I want to apologize. I want to make good on my fault. Redemption. Ming Online espouses to be a classical, highly orthodox, meditating Buddhist who cites Buddhist suttas, who frequents the company of leading Buddhist monks. And so I'm bringing to him one of the simplest and clearest and most powerful of the Buddha's discourses called the Angulimala Sutta, where Angulimala wants to kill the Buddha. The Buddha here is analogous with the people of Burma, the democracy people of Burma. And the Buddha senses Angulimala coming up from behind him. And Angulimala says to the Buddha, stop. And the Buddha turns around and looks at him and says, I have stopped, Angulimala. It's you who have not stopped. And that's exactly what I've said to Ming Online. Stop your tyranny. I have stopped. Dong Sun Tzu Chi stopped. The 12,000 political prisoners that are being tortured and raped and starved to death right now have stopped. They haven't stopped their dignity. They haven't stopped their revolution. They haven't stopped their conscience, but they've stopped their violence towards you. It's you, sir, who hasn't stopped with your jets, with your drones, with your bombs, with your rape, with your burnings, with your lies. 
And so I'm asking Ming online to follow the discourse of the Buddha in line with Angulimala. You have redemption in your hands. And I would invite you, sir, to read my letter and to feel it in your core of conscience, in your hiri, in your otapa. The action of reconciliation right now, you can win the Nobel Peace Prize. And if you want me to come to Napidor to do a book of conversations with you, I will risk going there. And I will tape our conversations and print every word verbatim that you say in a book, Conversations with Ming Online, the former dictator of Burma. But without that, what I suggest, call your people in all the various prison camps, labor camps around the country, and free every political prisoner right now. Show the world and your people that you mean business. My leadership is built on redemption, on truth-telling, on conscience, on freedom, on democracy, on fair play, on unity, all throughout the country with every ethnicity, free the people who are the most persecuted, the prisoners of conscience, free Da Aung San Suu Kyi, free the president, free every ethnic leader, put down your gun right now. Show us the power of your respect for Dhamma by being the embodiment of Angulimala, who then stopped, ordained, and it said in the classical Buddhist texts, soon thereafter became fully enlightened, eradicated anger, eradicated loba, eradicated moha, ignorance. Wow. And I guarantee you, if Ming Online does this, I, I can't guarantee, that's very arrogant of me to say, but I would suggest that Ming Online, if you were to just simply to call off and free the political prisoners and free Da Aung San Suu Kyi and tell your soldiers to stop shooting, you will be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. You will show the world. You'll show Putin. You'll show the president of Ukraine. You'll show Xi Jinping. You'll show the entire world that there is a different way to fight than through killing. It's feminine inspired reconciliation. A new form of democracy is birthed on the planet in an instant. And Ming Online holds the key in his heart at this very moment. If his wife would look at him and say, Sir, Mr. Clements has the point. He speaks for a lot of people. Free those political prisoners. Free Da Aung San Suu Kyi. Get on national television and say to the people of our country, stop shooting in the name of the Tamada. I want to call to Da, a council from around the world, and talk about what reconciliation, unity looks like in a civilized, mediated way. Okay, so that's point two. That's the third part of the book, the letter to Ming Online. And King Ashoka now, by the way, was the greatest torturer in Indian history. And he went to one of his torture centers to go there to indulge his evil toxicity. And he vomited. He had an awakening. He had a moment of redemption. And he became the greatest king in all throughout Buddhist history. And he spread Buddhism throughout the world with his children. And he's known today as the greatest Buddhist king that ever lived. But few people know that he killed close to 10 million people and committed torture and evil beyond recognition. And what happened in that camp in insane prison, what, way, way, way back in the third century AD? He saw someone being raped or tortured and he vomited. Ming online, vomit, purge your moha up. Your wife will clean up the mess and tell the people, I am sorry. I have made a grave error. Call the International Court in The Hague and say, I will be on the first plane to The Hague. I want to show an example to the world of what redemption looks like 
when someone in a leading role makes a mistake, I want to be held accountable. Do what you must do to show the world never again do evil the way that I've done evil. That's the third part of the book. The last two parts in one minute. A brilliant letter written by an enormously eloquent Buddhist monk from Tibet to Aung San Suu Kyi, talking about toxic patriarchy and neocolonialism and the power of the feminine and how the world got it wrong around the Rohingya crisis. This is one of the most prominent Tibetan Buddhist teachers in the world parallel to the Dalai Lama telling the world, every leader, telling the United Nations, telling the New York Times, you got it wrong. Here's how you got it wrong. It's in our book. And the last part is simple. The most important political events that have happened in the last five years. So you can briefly find out when the military coup d'etat took place, when Da Aung San Suu Kyi was put under hard labor, when Zayathal was executed and Kojimi was executed, executed enough Ming online. Mr. Biden, United Nations Security Council, Xi Jinping, call Ming online, call him out. Invite leaders around the world, women, men, artists, dictators, actors, military generals, teachers, anyone you want on your side, Ming Online, and anyone we want on the democracy side, let us come together in Naypyidaw. Let's come for one month, for two months, and film it worldwide. And let's have what's called the wisdom of a radical revolution of reconciliation through language, not violence and war. And let's show what the world looks like to have a feminine inspired dialogue where the power, the power of dosa driven, anger driven rage, the fury of my rage right now is not violent. It's passion. It's filled with metta. It's filled with love. That it's okay. It's appropriate to be outraged in the name of freedom, but I refuse to kill right now. Take the guns down. The people of Burma do not want to fight a defensive war, but they're compelled to in conscience. And if I were there, I would take up the gun myself, but I'm not. In the, in the meanwhile, redemption is in your hand. Call that summit. Bring in mediators, and you will see the people of Burma, the Thamada, and Ming Online, you will win the Nobel Peace Prize and show the world a way beyond violence and tanks and nuclear war and global destruction. You have that gift of being the next King Ashoka. So you, you've said something right there that I think is quite... I hesitate to say shocking, but it is definitely worth examining. You have been previously uh, an ordained monk. And yet, while we've heard other Buddhist monks talking about um, the, the parable of, of Nalagiri, um, the, the wild elephant that was, that was sent to kill the Buddha, and, and the Buddha overcomes Nalagiri with the power of metta, um, as as a lesson to say that violence is not appropriate, even in this context where the military is, as you correctly point out, murdering and torturing and raping and burning down with impunity, you you seem to take a much more pragmatic position. You seem to be saying that taking up arms and practicing violence can be justified and can be necessary uh, given given appropriate circumstances. Um, uh, so would you say this is in line with with uh, Buddhist teaching? It's in line with 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 what I call logical wisdom driven conscience and compassion and morality and ethical 
wisdom in the context of a world, a planet with the dualities of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and rape, and murder, and torture. I am not a black and white Buddhist. Someone trying to rape my daughter, I will take their throat out of their body. And I would fight till the death in Burma if I were in Burma and I was any one of those ethnic minorities right now or majorities, I would take up the weapon in defensive position to take out the evil dictator and anyone associated with him. And I would just pray that there was someone in the world that was saying what I'm saying as well, and that leaders around the world would listen, including the United Nations Security Council. I pray that this tape goes to everyone in the United Nations and every leader in the world and every media source in the world and every member of Congress and Senate in my country and study it and listen to it and tell me I'm a buffoon or I'm an idiot or an ideologue. But yes, I would prefer a dialogue in Napidaw tomorrow. In the absence of that, I'll say it very directly, very directly. I've said it many, many times. Ming Online, if you do not cease your evil, I call upon my president, Biden, to send a nuclear attack aircraft carrier to the Bay of Bengal and with a specific type of drone, enter your mansion in Napidaw and take you out like they did the leader of Al-Qaeda. Just like Benjamin Netanyahu, targeted assassination. If you don't want to hear redemption, that is your future. And anyone who does not act in accordance with that is complicit right now with mass murder. I would have said the same thing about Adolf Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Bin Laden. And I'm saying it about Ming Online, and I'm saying it with ethical, sila-driven, truth-telling composure. My voice is strong, but my conscience is quiet because it's indignity. The people of Burma, the people of the planet are my family, and there's a violator, and I refuse to watch violation and justify it through inaction. We've had enough in action in Burma now. Over. The United Nations Security Council's declaration was terse. It's not even remotely close enough. Call for redemption. Call for the wisdom of dialogue. Leaders around the world, ASEAN, demand that Ming Online bring 50, 100, 200, 500 people to Napidaw and let us in on the dialogue, sir. You have the first day. Tell us the wisdom of tyranny. Why are you killing the people? Tell the world why you're doing that, and let us listen. Let the world hear what's in your heart. Let us learn from you, and then you sit down, and let us talk, and then you have your rebuttal. We have our rebuttal. And after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, it could very well be that the Dalai Lama and Xi Jinping shake hands because I would want them there. And Da Aung San Suu Kyi is there and holds hands with Ming online and says, thank you, sir, for the moral courage to rise up like King Ashoka. He has it. I am saying this. I am not a president. I am not a prime minister. I'm not a member of the United Nations. But these words are words of feminine inspired revolution that I have had the grace to acquire from the good people of Burma. I am a student of revolution and what I'm saying, 98% of it comes from my education on the ground with the diverse ethnic groups and the democracy movement and the political prisoners that I've spent since 1988 studying earnestly, along with my adjunct study of meditation and mindfulness in Buddhism, and the mixture of that in Burmese culture. But what I'm saying is coming out of the country of Burma. And that's the gift that Burma offers the world. 
I'm not speaking as an outsider trying to, you know, put a white man's cover on this crisis. If someone were to ask me, what do you think Da Aung San Suu Kyi would say if she had the microphone right now? I dare say it. I think she would say exactly what I'm saying. Hmm. So I just wonder, what is your position then on Meta? Because you're, you're not leaving a whole lot of room here for compromise. Like it's force is required because force has been brought to the table. Do you believe that Meta can be used to overcome violent force or is it too late for that? I think it's down to the individual's personal respect for her or his own conscience that they make decisions based upon what's true and right for them. It's not my right to talk about the universality of a state of consciousness as being a political weapon and its effectiveness. It's the right of the individual to choose what they want in their body, what they want to emote out of their mind. But for me, the fury of Meta to me includes getting in his grill if I were his wife, I'd be so unthinkably embarrassed to be in a room with you, dude. Your actions are so shameful. I don't know how you could sleep at night except being under the label of a pathological psychopath, which I hate to say. My method to you, this is as rad as I'll get, but I do it because I'm often on stages as a satirist or a comedian. I wouldn't use a gun with Ming online. I would use the power of conscience. Invite me to Napidaw, sir. Talk to me. Put me in chains. I won't harm you. Talk to me. Film it. Let's talk about it. I want to I understand the machinations of how you think. I've never interviewed a bona fide terrorist. Tell me how you're not a terrorist. Tell me how you're so traumatized because of the British occupation of my own country and your historical trauma is so deeply embedded in, in my own psyche that I recently had a Western psychiatrist come to me and tell me that everything that I'm doing, I'm playing out because of the white man's oppression for 124 years in three wars, in World War II. My country is saturated in the white man's oppression. Alan, do you not understand that I am living through trauma? Okay, Ming Online, tell me that. That is wildly beautiful. I'm right there with you, dude. But just, if you don't mind, like, release the political prisoners and stop raping the girls and burning villages while we talk about it. Okay, just, I'm really down with your insights about the nature of the psyche. My meta would be that level of intensity. But if you wanted me to go further, personally, I think the guy needs a high dose of Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. I think he's a bona fide sociopath that needs whatever the most transformational, mind-expanding molecules are that could be put into his bloodstream along with the most spectacular music that turns his spirit into the wild jungle of beauty. And he sees visions of girls and boys all throughout the country in his mind's eye through artificial intelligence that are being burned and raped and bayoneted and, 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 and massacred. And he can't close his eyes because they're wired wide open. Well, let's have a moment of global meta for that being the outer reaches of nonviolent intervention to prevent a fucking genocide. Enough is enough. I wrote a book in 1990 called Burma, the Next Killing Fields. Four months in those ethnic minority areas watching massacres. It changed my life. What happened in Rakhine State has been happening all throughout the fucking country. The ethnics are outraged. We're all outraged. And Ming Online, you have it in your hands. The rarest of opportunities called 
redemption. Buddhism is a remarkable transformational theology. King Ashoka, read about him. He had a moment of redemption. Read about Jesus in the Bible. Redemption is the purest, most radical, feminine-inspired molecule in this God, well, I want to say goddess or godlessness that we're embedded, that is the closest that I can see to metta. Redemption. Redemption in action. But am I going to go to Napidor under false pretenses? And Mr. Clements, we can't wait to start our book of conversations. And for some reason, I've got some kind of hidden weapon in my under my skin, like a neural link from, you know, who knows, and then take his life out? No, no, no. But I'll tell you, I am, if I were anywhere near him, anyone who thought of him as a friend or an ally, I would be so in his grill. Do you, you're, you're humiliating, you're ruining for time immemorial the image of our beloved Burma. Ming Online, you're captured. You're a captive of a psychosis. Open your mouth. Put this clockwork orange in it. Tie yourself down. Let's purge you of this evil gene. Someone's got to do it. What else do you do? Keep giving weapons to the Thamada until there's no more democracy movement? Until there's no more Burma to save? I said this in my last book. The Dalai Lama said it 35 years ago. If we don't act on my country of Tibet in the next 10 years, there'll be no Tibet to save. Well, guess what? If we don't act in the next few minutes, there'll be no Burma to save. Ming Online is out of control. He's a raging psycho forest fire being weaponized by Putin and by Xi Jinping. That's called unlimited killing power. He's got all the oil. He's got the money. He's got the slaves. He's got the power. He's got the loot. He's got the cryptocurrency. He's got the terror. But the people are basically saying this time, guess what? There is no future with you, dude. There's no country that's going to take you. There is one solution. Either you listen to Mr. Clements and bring him to Napido, you have a book of conversations about redemption, or you unlock those prisons today and show us in action what it means to have a moment of compassion. And then we'll take you seriously. Otherwise, we're coming after you, dude. We're coming after you. The whole world. The whole world should come after him just to show what it really means to care about a country that wants to play fair. Burma wants to play fair. The birth of democracy in that country with diversity, with all the religions, with all the different languages, with all the resources, all people are equal. Burma is the example of universal human rights. One of the gravest evils oppressing a nation right now. And we have a chance to intervene, to show the future of life an opportunity of how to stop the murder of democracy. And that's what's happening in Burma. They're murdering anyone who even uses the word, the thought. Talk about Orwellian. The guy is a psychopath. Would I prefer to take him out? If there were people near him, and I'll end with this, I'm sure, just like just like Nay Wynn used to have eight different black limousines lined up outside of his mansion on Inlay Lake, and no one knew what he would get into because of fear of being, you know, poisoned. Ming Online is terrified, probably even by the sight of his wife. He can't trust anyone at this point because no one in the world who has an ounce of conscience finds him plausible. He's gone from leader to general to terrorist. I'm sorry, dude, the game is up. There is no future for you except the Nobel Peace Prize or 
your own voluntary flight to The Hague and do what they did with the leaders of the Bosnian crisis and take your karmic due so that the children can see and be inspired by what a man looks like when he does wrong and he makes good on that wrong. Give the kids a chance to be inspired. That's your only hope. Angulimala, go ordain with your monk of choice if you're still thinking about what you need to do. But unleash all the prisoners and call off the war. Go meditate for a month and have me at Napidaw. Bring all the people there. Let's talk about it. That's my metta to you, sir. A practical solution. Shave your head, close your eyes, look inside with a good Satipatthana Vipassana meditation teacher that will hold you accountable to what you see inside of your heart. So what do you think is the actual chance of that? I mean, you clearly believe in redemption. You, you, you've you brought up Angulimala multiple times. You, you clearly believe in the capacity of an individual, no matter how evil, to see the error of their ways. But in the case of Minar Lang and, and the psychosis that is evident and, and just the the, the hunger for power and the obsession with the subjugation of anyone he views as lesser, do you think there is any chance that he's going to have a change of heart, that he's going to have an epiphany? I, I absolutely do believe in the possibility because I do believe we are in a benevolent universe where the core of it, the soul of it, the anatta of it, the dhamma of it, the wisdom of it, the matrix of it is beautiful. Feminine-inspired unity, peaceful, soulful, just. And, and what could he do? It's very, very simple as a start. He has nothing to lose and everything in the world to gain. Invite Alan Clements to Napidaw to sit there for a month in a small little guest room, video camera with your people all around us, and I'll trust you, and let us have a heart-to-heart -heart set of conversations, and let the world in on how you think based upon someone who loves your country and your people. I don't want to say equal to you, more than you. I'm not killing them. I'm loving them. And I'm loving you, sir. I'm saying, I want to talk with you. I don't want to kill you. I want you to talk with me. Why me? I was a former monk in your country. I'm an American. I've studied democracy. I'm educated. I've met all of the leaders in your country, including many of the military. I met Utinu, who was the general under Tan Shui, excuse me, under Ne Win. I've met many military men, colonels and generals who are friends of yours. I love Myanmar. And the world will listen to us because I've done a lot of books, of interviews with the leaders of your country other than you. You have a chance, sir, to tell the world your story. And I really do believe, call it what you will. You can have all the advance money. There'll be no editorial control. Every word will be exactly what you said. Just let me ask the questions that I want and have what I say printed as I say it. And give me the chance to come into your country fearlessly and leave without harm. And let us bring your voice to the world. And let's call it Conversations with Ming Online, Burma's former dictator. And that to me is my gift to you, sir. That to me is your gift to the world. That's the gift to the generations of people in your country. Otherwise, they're going to be armed by people who care. Every ethnic group in the country will be fully armed within six months to eight months to two months to a year. And you know where they're coming? They're coming to Nebidaw. 
I'm not trying to threaten you. It's just obvious. You have put yourself into a no-win situation other than what I am offering you. And you think I'm a fool or you think the world is a fool or that it doesn't really matter? Sir, talk to your wife, talk to your handlers, talk to the leading monks in the country and ask them the efficacy of what Mr. Clements is offering you and take their advice and see what they tell you. See what they say to you in relationship to this open-hearted offer of a dialogue of conversations with you, sir, as the first start to end this conflict and to restore Burma to the radiant democratic gem that it has, that its potential is there and give the people a reprieve from the madness of this tyranny and this trauma and even your own soldiers who are just probably ready to turn on you in a dime. They're so sickened by shooting and maiming and raping and killing their own people and the ethnic minorities. They're holding back so much dosa in the name of this indoctrination. It will only hold for so much longer, sir, until there is no future that you have. Just study the history of Romania. Ceausescu stood in front of everyone. Listen to me. And where did he end up? Sir, your days are numbered and you are being offered a very elegant Dhamma inspired opportunity to elevate, to rectify, to heal, and to bring in a new form of democracy that the world has never seen before in nonviolent ways. It's in your hands. You will win the Nobel Peace Prize. You'll have a book around the world. You'll be a name, a household name. That man, do you know of him? He was a dictator. He was a terrorist. He transformed through conversation, through the power of Dhamma. And if that doesn't work for you, find a good meditation teacher in your own country. And, and trust me, I was one very difficult yogi. Go sit for three months in silence at the Mahasi Satana Yekta in Rangoon under a really qualified Vipassana teacher and follow the instructions carefully, sir. Watch your mind. Watch each of the chetasikas. Watch the sensations in your body. Every breath come and go could be your first and your last and your conscience will slowly rise to the surface and you'll start to cry just like Angulimala did and you'll fall over in tears and you'll go, how could I have done this? How could I have done this? And then you'll ask yourself, what can I do to make this wrong right? And you will do exactly what your conscience tells you. You'll free every political prisoner and you'll basically tell the entire country, I will do exactly what you wish to have done to me. I want my country restored on the terms of integrity, not my authoritarianism. Do it. Ask your wife, ask your friends, but do it now and stop killing. And I'm ready to take a ticket tomorrow to be there if you wish to have me. So you, you've spoken in very clear theological terms here. You, you speak about the values of meditation. You speak about dosa. You speak about the Dhamma. And you, you've mentioned that Minao Lang paints himself as a devoted and pious Buddhist. Um, but here's the thing, the, the, the contrast between the image that these guys have and the monks that they surround themselves with and the obvious evil of the actions that they carry out, it, it leads us to try to examine the military's perspective on Buddhism and perspective on religion. Like They clearly hate people who are not Buddhist because they go out of their way to murder them. But their own interpretation of Buddhism is one which is seemingly filled with ancient pre-Buddhist superstitions, this obsession with numerology, this this indoctrinated misogyny, the, the fear of, of menstruation, the fear of women's clothing, the fear of femininity. Like, 
are they even talking about Buddhism in the same terms that you're talking about it? Is it does it even make sense for you to speak about Buddhism and for the military to speak about Buddhism, or are you just talking two different languages? No, no. I listen. My teachers were considered some of the most respected, finest Buddhist masters in modernity in Myanmar. Mahasi Sayadaw, one of the two leaders of the Six Great Buddhist Council, brought forth by the former Prime Minister Unu, his successor, Seda Upandita, Seda Ujanaka, Seda Usujata, Seda Uzawana. I could go on and on and on. These are the same Buddhists. I'm not going to name other names of people he associates with. I don't want to bring their names into this dialogue. But the Buddhism that I'm talking about, to me, is not some aberrant American diversion from Dhamma as it's found in classical Theravadan Pali. I spent 35 years immersed in Dhamma and in revolution and in the saturation of my heart in the culture of Burma, not just Burmese Buddhists. I've been all throughout the country. I'm a strong follower of Christianity. I've been to all the Islamic countries. My family comes from Lebanon and Syria. Ming Online is captured by a delusion, an illusion. It's a psychological issue. It's not a theological Dhamma issue. Why this is happening? Why does psychosis happen? I could go on and on and on about that. It's very difficult to understand the mind that is without conscience. It's very rare to study the mind of a serial killer. I once met the chief psychiatrist on a flight from California to Hawaii, who was at the, one of the maximum security prisons in California with those who only had done the most egregious crimes against other life and put into these solitary confinement horror holes and I asked him, do you ever see redemption among these people? He said, Alan, oddly, strangely, sadly, they often shake the bars until they die as victims of society. That's why I'm inviting Ming online. Talk to me. No one's talking to him. I think that's the absence of the feminine inspired dialogue. People are afraid to talk in Burma, to the elders, to the monks, to the hierarchy, to the Buddha. There's too much obedience. And where that came from, toxic, white, oppressive patriarchy. It gets right back to the 124 years of white imperialism from, from way back in 1812 when, when Burma was plucked, taken, stolen, the ruby of Asia brought to Downing Street, given to the Queen and 15 million people in Burma are subsequently subjected to the white man's domination, the wars, the, the traumas. I can understand the horror that Ming Online has generationally grown up with under Tan Chui. In the monastery, we didn't just talk about watching our breath. I was a very close friend of Prime Minister and his daughters, who knew was an amazing man. I lived in his room in the monastery, built for him. To look at Burma today without looking into the influence, the trauma of imperialism and patriarchy and, and white male authoritarian indoctrination, you, you, you just can't look at Israel without taking into account Nazi Germany. I'm not trying to equate England's imperialistic, genocidal, 124-year occupation to the Holocaust, but it's pretty terrible what happened in Burma. And I understand, Ming Online, part of the dilemma of having been a monk, and I'm a real slow learner, I'm extremely arrogant at times, is it's so hard to be accountable 
to the ways you lie to yourself, to the ways you've been conditioned, to your belief systems, to your obedience to false structures of authority that you call justice and unity and fair play that turned out to be totalitarian, dictatorial, and torturous. Not only mislabeled, misidentified. Where did that kind of torturous conditioning come from? I'm not blaming it on England, but wherever the white man went, they did so at the expense of the indigenous people. It's well documented through calculated acts of mass murder or genocide or rape. But, 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 as the Buddha said, there's no first cause to dukkha, suffering. You can't find someone to place the blame on. Thus, the power of Angulimala, the power of redemption. I asked Aung San Suu Kyi back in the day, all these same questions that we're talking about today, about the influence of the British, the influence of the trauma of unrecognized, un, un, undiscovered, uninvestigated trauma. Now, Alan, isn't the time for us to look into those. There will be a time when the healing can take place. And maybe she was wrong. Maybe that we needed to bring in 10,000 psychologists to Burma from around the world, from every country, to listen, just to listen to the people and to bestow upon the people money and service and food and water and help and service and to help alleviate that that 125 year long toxic patriarchal blanket of horror upon the indigenous population of Burma. Three, four, five thousand years of recorded history. I don't know exactly. So Ming Online, I I have compassion for you, sir. And I have a solution. But I feel very, very uncomfortable with going to sleep yet again another night and knowing that anyone in this world is being raped or murdered. I dedicated my life when I became a monk, although I was thrown out and disrobed, to end the violence in my own being. That to me is the core tenet of Dhamma and Buddhism. What do you teach? The Buddha was asked. The end of violence to self, the end of suffering to self and other, the end of dosa, loba, and moha, greed, anger, and delusion. That made sense to me. And that to me cannot be debated. Either you live it or you lie about it. And your actions tell the story. Are we deluded at times by our behaviors? by our words, by our thoughts, by our psychologies, by our memories, absolutely. But enough is enough. And enough people have been tortured and raped and murdered and bombed and persecuted now. Where the game's up, dude. You're in a corner. Draw upon your own Dhamma, your own Buddhism, and look to your conscience and say, you know, I'm going to be the first to call off the war. I'm going to put down the gun. But he can't do that. You know why? Because he's crossed the line. And the ethnic minorities all around the country now are the majority. They are the people. Burma is no longer ethnic minorities. We are the people. And he knows that. And there is no turning back. And so the guy's in a corner. He's terrified. And the only way a terrified, insecure male acts is to increase the very thing that they should stop doing, which is to stop terrorizing in the name of your own unrecognized trauma, your own fear, your own greed. And that's why I'm offering this very unusual solution. The monks are not offering this solution. They're not even offering him, come meditate for three months. We don't want your dana. We don't want your flowers. We don't want your food. We don't want your needing to be chanted to. We don't want your faux five precepts. We don't want anything from you. We want you to basically live by the five precepts, meditate, and stop persecuting people. 
whether they be from Shan State, Mon State, Rakhine State, Karin State, Chin State, wherever state, stop and show that you really are a respectable Buddhist. From there, there's possibility. And if he needs help with this, and I'm sorry to go on about this, but my heart is broken. Bring me to Napidaw. Make your case, sir. Tell me to my face, Alan Clements, you white man, you persecuted. You committed genocide on your own American indigenous people. You could give a shit about them. And you tell me that I should care about what's going on in my country based upon what your people did to my people? At least we're talking about it. And that to me would be the first turning, call it, of the feminine in political dynamic action, I would say in the world at a global level. Talking about the trauma, talking about the evil, talking about the horrors of colonial oppression, talking about World War II, talking about Japanese fascism, talking about kamikazes, talking about the women who came from India, who were Hindus, who blew up their bodies in Sri Lanka. They weren't Muslims, they were Hindus. The Japanese fascists were Buddhists. They were nationalists who threw those airplanes into aircraft carriers in battleships. They weren't Muslims. Ming Online, be a leader born from redemption. Study King Ashoka, Seda Upandita, one of the leading meditation masters in modern times, aspired, talked about, honored the power of redemption within the King Ashoka metaphor as what Burma needs in their own leadership. He talked to Da Aung San Suu Kyi about that, and he talked to you about it, sir, in the book, Wisdom for the World and Mindful Advice to My Own People. I asked him questions that were directed to you. Exactly the same in the book, Aung San Suu Kyi from Prison, and a letter to a dictator. This time I wrote a letter right to you, sir. You have a chance to show the world and go down in history the power of Dhamma redemption. That is rockin'. That is rad. That is incredible. And it may very well be end the war in Ukraine and Russia. It may end the war in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. It may end the wars around the world. It's possible. It may send a ripple of eth ethical inspiration to see the world's leading terrorist. Oh my God, how did that happen? Let's study the machinations of what went on in those conversations. Study Upandita's language of nonviolence. Secondly, study his language of reconciliation. Thirdly, study his language of healing. Fourth, study his language of coexistence. Fifth, study his language of unification with differences. And then sixth, study the wisdom of illuminating the first five with the highest aspirations of an individual manifesting her in his own unique expression of freedom, the oxygen of civilized society, the universal declaration of human rights, the most abused doctrine on planet Earth. Three pages. Sir, you're wrong, I'm right, and together, both of us are right. Bring me to Napidor and let's talk about it and release these political prisoners right now, please. Call all the prison guards, release them, give them food, give them money, give them medicine, help their families, release Da Aung San Suu Kyi and tell your soldiers, stop. I know it's a habit right now, stop. 
put the gun down. Please go home. Extra pay and chill. And please ask the whole country's ethnic armed groups fighting in a defensive war. Please, I beg of you, just two weeks, two weeks, stay back. Let me feel this. I'm listening to Mr. Clements' dialogue here. I want to let it in. Please give me two weeks to feel this. Please, please, please don't shoot. Just stop. I want to feel the wisdom of calling off violence. I want to return to the sanctity of the reason why I call myself a practicing Buddhist. Ahimsa, the power of nonviolence. So we focused heavily on Min Lang himself um, for quite a bit here, but I think it'd be useful to take this back to a, the broader global context. Uh, the international community is watching, but the international community is not really taking all that much action, let's be completely honest. So outside of this, this concept of Min Lang's mentality and spirituality, what do you think is the role for the international community because you seem to be very conscious of the of the politics of outsiders getting involved in situations that are not their own and that they don't fully understand and the role that colonialism has played in in the problems in Myanmar do you see a call for western powers to intervene once again in Myanmar or do you think that they should be playing a secondary role and propping up internal forces wow my Inside is saying, thank you for the question. My outer insight is saying, wow, what a challenging question. For fear of sounding contradictory, I stand on what I just said for the last two hours on my personal remedy approach to resolving next stage possible solution to the circumstances that we see in Myanmar. With that said, with that said, I'm just imagining if I were in a position of presidential prime minister, United Nations power, I think what I would do, which I've actually said publicly many times, is I think I would swing one of those seven nuclear powered U.S. aircraft carriers off the coast of Taiwan in the South China Sea, I'd swing one of them into the Bay of Bengal. And I would probably, with the jets on deck, put three fingers up to show solidarity with the people on where I stand as an American leader and give him one month to consider my ultimatum and keep it really simple. Stop or face the consequences. That's what number one, what I would do if I were President Biden. Call me an idiot, call me a fool, call me a dreamer, do anything you want. Stop wasting all that fuel with seven of them in the South China Sea and threatening Xi Jinping. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, Mr. Biden send one nuclear aircraft carrier to the Bay of Bengal and show those 50 million people of Burma right now undergoing democratic genocide, solidarity with the three fingers that we stand with you, democracy movement. We stand with you, ethnic minorities, majority. And tell Mr. Ming online, listen, dude, I know that you think you know. I know that you think you're the leader. I know that you think you're right. We all make mistakes, but I'm giving you 30 days to think it through or face the consequences. And I'm not going to tell you what the consequences are, but you can see through my actions where I stand. And if you're wondering what I might do, just go back to Kabul and look at the footage of bin Laden's successor. I am very adept at removing someone without harming one civilian. Oh, 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 Alan, are you advocating targeted assassination? Yeah, I'm a leader. You're asking me a leadership question. 
I'm stretching way out of my skin to say that. But if I were a leader, I were in the Oval Office, you'd be hard pressed to tell me not to do that. And to think that I would actually listen and not do that. And to show some spine and show some regard. And then, you know, Mr. Xi Jinping, I think you should uh, like release all those activists and democratic leaders in Hong Kong that have disappeared and show some spine to Xi Jinping and say, dude, we're a democracy. You're a totalitarian dictatorship. There is a distinction. And we're showing that the divide isn't between Taiwan and you. It's called democracy and totalitarianism. And I just kind of like the wisdom of pause and let them reflect upon, whoa, whoa, Mr. Biden has gained some stealth, moral power. And I think that's what's sadly lacking right now is, 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 is ethical power within all forms of leadership. And so these questions sound almost like absurd and the answers sound like, like a, someone unhinged to even say these things when they're so obvious. We've divorced ourselves from each other so sufficiently that we're willing to tolerate genocides, murders, ethnic cleansings, and rapes in the name of resources and power and politics. Talk about numb and trauma. If that was within a household in which in one of the bedrooms there was someone being forcibly gang raped. No, 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 no. Come on, I want to watch Gang of Thrones, man. Don't leave it alone. We'll be psychopaths. And so I take the R.D. R, R. D. Lang approach, you know, insanity is a sane response to an insane world. And my response is a sane response to insane leadership. And that's what I would say to Ming online if I were President Biden or global leaders today. Where's your moral spine? And secondly, I would say, guess what? Mr. Putin, Mr. Xi Jinping, yes, 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 we're weaponizing the war in Ukraine and Russia. But you know something? We really like Burma because of the power of their democracy and the diversity of their people and their history with philosophy and psychology and agrarianism and Buddhism. And you know something? We've adopted mindfulness even in the military in America. We think Burma is a little bit of a special country to take exception. So we're telling you, stop giving them weapons, okay? Stop. Stop. And meanwhile, if you don't mind, return Tibet to Tibet and give the Dalai Lama a place to go back to. We're going to start like being accountable to like ethical politics. It's, it's absurd. I sound like I'm a comedian, Ricky Gervais or some other person on a stage where everyone's kind of laughing at the absurdity of how truthful this is and the stupidity of how no one will act because it's so right. And that's what being insane probably means when you're in a prison and they're trying to indoctrinate you to do something that's a lie. But it's so simple. Please stop raping my sister, my mother, my daughter in the name of any belief system. Let's learn to talk about it. I don't know who else should say it, but there are many women in Burma that I've interviewed in my books who know the wisdom of let's talk about it. Let's dialogue about it. Let's sit in the same room and listen to one another and learn from one another. I've never seen a more forgiving, patient culture. And I've traveled the world for decades. I've read numerous books. I'm well studied. Desmond Tutu has blessed some of my books with his endorsements. No Future Without Forgiveness, the epic book he wrote after four years of leading the Truth Council in South Africa, listening to people who voluntarily came up and talked to the Truth Council. 
I raped your daughter. And they asked, why did you do that? And based upon the answer, they evaluated the person's sincerity, the heartfulness in which they spoke about their redemption and made judgments and imprisonment accordingly. And some walked free based upon the evaluation. We have examples of noble leadership. And so Ming Online has in his hands the Angulimala possibility. And the whole world could learn a lesson at this epic moment. Just as the 45 scientists and Nobel laureates called the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists last week in Chicago, a formation of intellectuals that started post-World War II to evaluate the threats on humanity. They turned what's called the doomsday clock up 10 seconds to 90 seconds before total planetary annihilation. And they evaluated the factors on why they chose to add 10 seconds closer to Armageddon. And one of them is the lack of moral guided leadership. And all I'm saying is something so obvious is to stop killing. Someone's got to stop first and let's talk about it. In Burma, those ethnic groups, I know many of these leaders, I've been there, I've met with them. I love the country. They've got grievances. You can be sure, even with what's gone down post terrorist takeover, I don't want to call it a military coup d'etat, terrorist takeover, February what, 1st, 2021? I wouldn't be surprised if Ming Online said, hey, listen, man, I'm over my head or whatever he wants to say. I, I, I want to call it a, a peace month, a treaty. I want to just back down for a month to reevaluate. I promise I won't regroup. I promise I won't take any money or weapons from Xi Jinping or Putin. I just want a breather to reevaluate my ethical environment. I wouldn't be surprised if those leaders would say, go for it, dude. It's yours. You got a month, 30 days, time's clicking, 29 days, 28, 27, 26. Meanwhile, get Mr. Clemens to Napido and start talking to him and tell us the fuck why you're killing us in the name of your fucking sociopathy. The days are numbered. And so I don't know what else to say except to reincarnate as the next U.S. president and to act this out in my next birth, 35, 40 years from now, after Burma has been desecrated and decimated, and then there's four generations post-Gen X, and Burma is just one dystopian land that's burning and burning and burning, and no one, it's uninhabitable? Is that the future of Burma? That looks like Ming Online's vision, because he can't defeat these defensive forces. It's impossible. He's at perpetual war, and he will lose unless he takes the Angulimala approach or the King Ashoka approach. That's why it's so precious. Burma has, Burma now is the ruby of the planet on a spiritual level. Kipling would say it was the ruby of South Asia. Now it's the spiritual ruby. It's the essence. It's the soul of every religion. It's about redemption. Burma holds that. Ming Online in his hands. And if he makes the first move, releases those people, you can be sure those leaders of those ethnic groups, they're going to go, hallelujah, we will give you 30 days, my friend. You've got them. So I don't know what else to say about the world. Cut the money, cut the guns, absolutely. If I were on the ground and I was a leader, I would say make Burma uninhabitable. When you read Nelson Mandela's book, he made a statement 
make South Africa uninhabitable, make the white man's apartheid uninhabitable. I say to the people of Burma, I stand with you, all leaders of the world. If you're not going to basically listen to me, make Ming Online's terrorism called dictatorship ungovernable. By all means, disrupt the machinations of his dictatorial madness. And he knows it's coming. How many more assassinations in Rangoon, in Monua, in Malmin, in Mandalay, does he need to see with medium to high ranking military people? How many more buildings and malls need to be bombed? How many more monasteries need to be closed? How many more petrol stations need to be burned? How many more farms need to go unharvested? How many more villages need to be raised to the ground and tortured? How many more women do we need to see cry who are giving birth to babies that die? It's a dystopian madness. We're at the end game. It usually takes a very brave person to morally rise up to say enough is enough. I've crossed the line. Enough is enough. I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to embrace the archetypal mother. I, I am the archetypal mother here. I am going to be held accountable. My country is more important than me fucking staying alive and being right. The world has told me I am wrong. My wife is telling me I'm wrong. My senior advisors and colonels are telling me I'm wrong. Even my cronies, they don't even want my fucking protection anymore because they know that I'm ethically bankrupt. They fear that I'm going to be assassinated with me when I get killed. You're alone, dude. Give it up. And redeem yourself. I'm not doing this as a bluff or some kind of moral high ground. I love democracy. I love freedom. I'm going to die soon. You're going to die soon. My daughter is going to be alive and maybe she'll choose to have children. But I want to see freedom thrive and flourish. And Burma was a gift to me. It saved my life. I learned revolution. I learned Dhamma. I learned how to sit and watch my mind. Yes, I'm flawed. I have many problems. Yes, I can lie. Yes, I'm deceptive. But Burma showed me the power of accountability, self-honesty, karuna, metta, mudita, upeka. They showed me the wisdom of the paramis. They showed me the power of the feminine. Da Aung San Suu Kyi taught me, Alan, learn to listen. That is revolution. And learn the power of active compassion, active metta, and a future that's so far reaching that I may never see democracy even in my lifetime, but sow the seeds every day of your life until there are no more life in you. That's the Da Aung San Suu Kyi that I remember. And Ming Online is trying to murder her because she's Ma Su. She has the power of being the archetypal feminine embodiment in Burma. Everyone in Burma knows that. The country has risen. Yes, she has faults. Yes, she has flaws. We're not holding her to the perfection model. But she is shown through her own choice-making power how to resolve differences through the feminine and inspired power of metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, panya, wisdom-inspired language. She showed the world a new form of nonviolence post Martin Luther King, post, post, post Gandhi. And, and probably re inspired a form of nonviolence that could be found deep even within Dhamma if you studied carefully the history of King Ashoka, the greatest Buddhist king ever to have lived, who put out dissent through the power of conscientious use of the weapon in defense as a leader. That's your responsibility. 
Dong Sun Tzu treating him that. Ming Online, you're putting out freedom through violence. And you're instilling terror and tyranny over democracy and justice. You got it wrong. And that's why it's so archetypal. I think that's why it's so pivotal right now. If only the world could listen to this, 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 this interview and be transcribed and translated and sent worldwide. Not for my sake, please. I will soon die. But for the children of, of Burma, the children of the world, give democracy a chance to breathe in Burma in a way that democracy has yet to ever breathe. Put down the weapon and talk and heal and hear about our differences and move into the future with a new form of freedom and just keep liberating our freedom unless we'll be imprisoned by the very freedom that we deny. Be careful. Be careful of the freedom you call freedom, as it's been said. It'll imprison you. And I think Ming Online is imprisoned by the reappropriation of something that he calls freedom. But in fact, it's deception, it's denial, and it's violence. Thus, the clockwork orange analogy. With Malcolm McDowell and eyes wide open. He's got to see what he's doing to the people. He should see firsthand what it means for a woman to be raped in insane prison with his wife and his children watching on the same flat screen. He should be forced to watch that over and over and over again as first stage redemption to show us how pure and true you really are. To trust you that you got the Angulimala right. You can trust me. I'm willing to face what I've done in the name of a lie. Anyway, that's 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 my riff, that's my rap, that's my hope, that's my dream, that's my prayer, that's my scream. And I don't apologize for the intensity of it. I wish it were heard. I'm frustrated. I'm upset, but I feel empowered that you and the folks that you are all associated with and the good people of Burma are doing what you're doing and that you're not alone, that we're in solidarity with you and that we will stay with you as best as we can. And may, may these words be translated and shared Debate, talk, bring it into the media. I invite you to invite me to Napidaw, to the New York Times, to CNN, to BBC, all the radio stations and TV stations. Tell me I am unhinged. Find out the nuances of my philosophical spiritual beliefs. Ask me what I know, what I'm not sharing. I'm honored to talk with you in a nonviolent way. We'd like to take this time to thank our generous supporters who have already given. We simply could not continue to provide you with this content and information without the wonderful support of generous donors, listeners, and friends like you. Each episode helps in providing access to one more voice, one more perspective, one more insight. Every donation of any size is greatly appreciated and helps us continue this mission. We greatly appreciate your generosity, which allows us to maintain this platform. Thank you. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person, IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, military defection campaigns, undercover journalists, refugee camps, monasteries and nunneries, education initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. 
We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A-L-O-K-A-C-R-A-F-T-S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. Oh, ba, yara nanda, da, yara nanda, 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 y